Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rinsel at a time. It is Thursday morning, and you know what that means. That means we bring on the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. How are you, Michael? I'm doing very well. So uh, what I want to do here, Jonathan, is I want to paint a vision. And I'm going to paint a vision of, a, of an aggressive Fed. We'll kind of paint that picture. But I want you to kind of step back and remind our audience what it all means. Because I think, I think there will be impact immediately. I think there will be longer ramifications. And I do not believe that a lot of people are thinking about it. You ready to go? Mm -hmm. So here we go. I'm going to paint the vision of an aggressive Fed. And I think it's going to be more aggressive than most people, if not everyone is thinking. So first and foremost, Jonathan, we get a half a point move in March, which you know I've been calling for for quite a while. But I want to also follow that up with a half a point move in the very next meeting. Wow. As of today, I got to tell you, I don't believe it, but I want to price in the most aggressive state. And then finally, the last thing I want to say, Jonathan, is we get up full point in two meetings, but we end the year up 200 or two points. So, Jonathan, I think that's pretty aggressive, and uh, I think it will have some interesting ramifications. What do you, when we when I when I say that, what do you think? I what I think is that you will prick the bubble if that if you move that aggressively, right? The the at least in the multifamily market, mm -hmm. assets have been priced to perfection for a very long time, right? And what that means is what price to perfection means is there's no room for error in your underwriting. You have to get it exactly spot on, be exactly right, and get your execution exactly right and predict the future exactly right in terms of what exit cap rates are going to be when you need to refinance mm -hmm. or sell. Mm -hmm. All of that has to be exactly right, or uh, you are either going to miss your projections, or in the worst case scenario, you are going to be looking at some really serious problems, like uh, up and including to foreclosure because you can't refinance your, your property, right? So um, things have been priced that way for quite some time. And just by way of example, you know, I was underwriting a deal yesterday. Uh, and using the, the guidance, the price guidance from the seller as to what they wanted to get. And it, I could only underwrite that deal to double digit returns with mm -hmm. extremely aggressive underwriting assumptions that I would not normally use. And, okay. um, and, and even then the whole thing depended on cap rates basically staying where they are and being able to sell at right. the same kind of cap rates. If that didn't happen, I mean, I didn't even bother to go and see exactly how much cap rates would have to move for us to lose money on the deal, because I know that it's not that much. <laughs> it's not that much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, when, when the deal was, you know, already, you know, sort of priced where it was. Um, so, so that, that's the situation, right? And that whole situation depends on very, very low interest rates. That's how we've gotten here. Yeah. That's how we've been able to become so aggressive because the the spread between the cap rate and the and the and the interest rate that they could get was enough that they could make money, right? Yeah. So, and, and you've also got the whole chase for yield problem, right? Where mm -hmm. when when the Fed lowers rates so much. Uh, it basically forces people out the risk, and they're doing this intentionally. They're forcing people out the risk curve mm -hmm. into riskier and riskier assets, hoping to spur economic activity. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing that now for 10 years, more. I mean, 15 years, right? So uh, we're well, well into this. Um, so the whole world has come to depend on cheap money. If you take the cheap money away, there are going to be consequences. There are lots of people who try to tell me that there are no consequences when the Fed takes the cheap money away because of savings glut and all kinds of other things, money on the sidelines, what have you. Yeah. I, this is complete and utter nonsense. Absolutely. There, there is going to be an impact on pricing because even though there are, lot, there are deep pocketed people out there, right? Who have lots of cash to put into stuff. Um, not every buyer is like that. Not every, not those buyers are not going after every asset 
-hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. right? And a, a lot of sort of in the syndication world, people are much more thinly capitalized, yes. right? And they're drawing money from individual investors who, when interest rates go up, some of them are gonna start to say, either, I don't know where this is going, I'm scared, or, hey, I can just go buy T-bills now and get a couple of points and just wait and see what happens, right? And so, yeah. and, and frankly, even and institutional money too, like if interest, if the T-bill, if the treasury goes back to something normal-ish, mm -hmm. Insurance companies are going to start putting a lot of money into T-bills because it's basically risk-free. They're going to diverse, they're going to be, start going back up the risk curve, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that's going to suck a lot of money out of the system. But the other thing, and the more important, the more sort of immediate effect is going to be that banks are going to give you less money, yes. right? Because when interest rates go up, we've talked about this many times before in this podcast, you have something called a debt service coverage ratio. Mm -hmm. Whatever your debt, your debt service is comprised of your interest and principal payments that you have to make. Mm -hmm. When interest rates go up, the, the number of dollars that you have to pay to the, to the bank each month goes up accordingly. That means that you need even more net operating income to hit the coverage ratio that the bank wants. And usually the banks want 1.25 or they will not move. And some non-bank lenders want 1.3, right? So some want less, but some want more. Depends on the deal. The point is, whatever they're asking for, 1.25x or more, you are going to have to generate that much more NOI on your deal in order to get, uh, to get the proceeds, right? And so the NOI does not move up when interest rates go up, right? It's going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and also because NOI is historical, right? They may project NOI, but they're going to, they're also going to be look, looking historically, they're going to be looking at the last one to three months of performance and try to project mm -hmm. that into the future, mm -hmm. right? So they're not going to, you may go to the bank and say, hey, I'm going to raise my rents 20% across the board. And the bank will say, well, that's great, mm -hmm. but we're not going to lend on that basis, right? right. So uh, so they're, so they're going to give you less proceeds. So what is that? What happens when they give you less proceeds? Well, either you have to come up with more equity, right? Now you've got to go, go beg your investors for more money, but at the same time, you also have to tell them, oh, by the way, your return is going to be lower because we're getting less leverage. Right? So that's, that's fun. Like going to investors and saying, Hey, give me more money for less return. They're going to be like, why? Right. right. And then, uh, or if, Either that's going to happen or you're going to offer the sellers less money because the bank is going to tell you like, hey, at this price, I'm only giving you 67% proceeds. I'm not giving you 75%. Right. Right? So you're going to go to the seller and say, I'm not getting as much money, so I'm not offering you as much money. And I'm literally seeing this happen right now. I mean, last week, interest rates spiked and um, a lot of deals that were in progress got their proceeds cut, right? In progress, contracts already signed. You cannot move that, that price, right? Unless you have a very, very accommodating seller, right? Or a seller who is a little, thinking a little bit more like, hey, this is, gonna, this is happening to everybody. So, you know, but the sellers are gonna hold your feet to the fire. And especially if you're like already out past being able to uh, get your hard money, to, you know, deposit back. If you're already hard on your money, there's not yeah. much you can do except try to go raise more money. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually working on a deal right now where, we're, we've actually been looking at this property, trying to buy it, and there's a there's a buyer ahead of us, but for whatever reason, they were able to negotiate a deal with the seller where they would do all their due diligence first, and then when they were done, sign the contract and close right away. So they actually don't have a contract yet. They just have like an MOU or something yeah. mm -hmm. to do or an access agreement to do due diligence, and then they're going to sign the contract and right however what's happened now is the market has now moved against them yeah. so that, that buyer looks like they're going to drop out because they can't get the proceeds that they need anymore to to do this deal mm -hmm. um, so that means it may come back to us we may be in a different situation because we we're planning on going in lower leverage anyway and uh there's, you know, this is for Japanese investors who have certain tax advantages that Americans don't have. So it may not, 
really affect us that much. So we still may, able to, may be able to do the deal, but uh, for already for this group, and I'm hearing this also from other things, that proceeds are getting cut mid-deal. And uh, going forward, this is, you know, this is what's gonna happen. So pricing is going to be affected. Now, what you will see is you probably won't see like an immediate crash in the market where prices come down because sellers have anchored, been anchored to these high prices for years and years and years. Right? So what's going to happen is the market is just gonna really slow down for a while in terms of transaction volume because sellers and, uh, and buyers will not have a meeting of the minds, right? And they will, sellers are gonna be looking at the situation saying, hey, this property was worth $10 million yesterday. It's worth $10 million today. And buyers are gonna be looking at it and saying, no, it's only worth nine five now because my proceeds just got cut, right? And it's going to take a while for sellers to capitulate, and 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 you know I, I saw this happen at, after the financial crisis when I when I first got into the business, and we were looking at a lot of deals where you know they were priced for two thousand six, yep. and that's why they were on the market for three, four, five years. Yeah. Right. So because the sellers were not uh, were not being realistic, and in some cases they couldn't be realistic because they couldn't get a short sale because their lenders wouldn't agree to a short sale, but they were actually underwater. Mm -hmm. in terms of real value, right? Yep. So uh, they were just sort of stuck and their lenders were just extending them because they didn't want to foreclose into a, you know, a glut of foreclosures, right? So uh, I'm not certain it's going to get that bad, but, I, but, the, but the people who are going to get really whacked on this are people who, um, you know, potentially, right? Unless the, the Fed slows down or it could, let's just we'll say in the scenario you're talking about, people who have to refinance bridge debt and now their yeah. whole exit scenario, their whole, their whole exit to permanent financing scenario has got a hole blown in it. And now they need to go find extra equity for, to, to fill the gap, you know, and, 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 and probably a lot of people don't realize too that um, purchase money mortgages are usually 75%, right? Refi though is not, refi is usually 70%, right? So yeah. if you haven't added a lot of value to the asset in the time that you have to you know, in that time period, you know, the, the, the idea is you're taking bridge debt, you're going to do a rehab, you're going to add a lot of value. And then at 70%, you're going to more than cover the, the loan you have to repay. You're going to have a little extra equity, you can give it back to your investors or whatever the case is, uh, and everybody's happy. Um, but if you don't add a lot of value in that time, right, or maybe you add a lot of value and you raise your rents, but cap rates go up and it cancels mm -hmm. it all out, that 70% may not be enough to refi the deal, right? So now you've got to go look for additional equity to fill the gap. And yeah. that's a situation that a lot of people are, are it's going to make a lot of people very un unhappy if that happens. But if we go up as aggressively as you, the other thing too that will happen, and this is not sort of a math thing, this is a psychology thing. If, if, rates, if the Fed comes and raises rates that quickly, that sharply, that is going to cause a lot of people to pull back from the market because then they're going to think, oh, the Fed may do it again, right? And so they're going to they're going to drop back into a wait and see attitude, right? So yeah, that'll that'll cause them because they'll then they'll start thinking, you know, there's going to be the buy the dip dips and you know, the dips who buy the dip, yeah, who are going to be like, oh, you know, it's now it's our chance, right? But most people are going to pull back and and wait and see. And uh, you know, if inflation continues to be ugly, and the and the consensus is the Fed is going to raise rates more, that's just people who understand these things are going to understand it's going to affect pricing, yeah. and they're they're going to wait and see. Also, they'll know there's going to be foreclosures coming, and they're going to be saving up their pennies for those. Absolutely, but who doesn't yeah. love a bargain, right? Yeah. So uh, that's kind of the scenario that I would see playing out. Yeah, so let me kind of summarize what I see, because I see the same thing. In fact, I've been waiting for, for this. Uh, the asset bubble got bigger. And this is mainly a commercial apartment thing. And, and I sold my, a couple of apartments in late 19 because I thought it was already crazy and it only got crazier. But yeah, current, current in-flight deals, we're talking open escrow, underwriting stage. Some of those are going to blow up. Some people are going to lose their hard money uh, because the rates went against them. And they went against them in a big way. Totally yep. agree with that. Second, the ones that are in the most pain, I would ask you folks to go back and look at Jonathan Twomley's playlist on my channel. 
We've been talking about bridge debt. More importantly, we have been talking about debt structures in the commercial space that I felt were very similar to 06 residential. Short-term, IO only, weird assumptions or wacky assumptions. Those are going to blow up. Bridge debt could be as short as 12 months. And if they got a refi out of that into a market that is substantially higher, not only are refi uh, percentages lower, 25% down versus 30, but rates are higher than purchase money loans as well. And if the, a purchase money loan is now five and an eighth, the refi could be five and a half. Yeah. All of this stuff is coming. And then finally, you were so right. Transactions are going to fall off a cliff, but prices won't fall immediately because of that anchoring or price elasticity. Uh, you know, if, the Fed got aggressive over the next two meetings. We could be looking at a six or nine month gap where we just have air pockets before the bridge debt starts to come due and we start to hear about people going, oh, by the way, I can't, I can't raise equity. Video yeah. number two, folks, or interview number two, we're going to talk about a recession and I'll just leave this here. What people don't realize, especially in the syndication space, in my opinion, is you are relying on a base of individuals who can get scared in a nanosecond and when they do i saw it, i saw it in the last crisis they retreat they do un they do financially destructive things because they are scared and they don't want to take the next dollar so it it could get very very dangerous and frankly i've been waiting for it so uh, i'm excited by what's coming because i think the fed's going to be aggressive not this aggressive but i think they're going to be more aggressive than people anticipate mm. so jonathan how can people find you yeah, there's a whole bunch of ways. If you'd like to get on my investor list, please Google Two Bridges Asset Management LLC and fill out the form you'll find on the website. Uh, you can also join my free Facebook group, uh, which has got about 12,000 people in it. Uh, it is called the Multifamily Investment Community. Just jump on Facebook and look that up and join the conversation there. And if you'd like to just get on my general mailing list, which talks about stuff like educational opportunities and also deals from time to time, uh, just go to multifamilylaunchpad.org and you can download a free ebook there and uh, get onto the email list. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. Yep.